All right, so uh, welcome to the FRC warm up 2022. Uh, so this is the electrical component session, uh, and this is hosted by uh, Team Taters, so FRC 2122. Um, so we're excited to, to be hosting here, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Servotix, for the, for the invite to host. Um, we'll jump into it here. Uh, just a little bit about the presenters here. Um, I'll be pre uh, primarily presenting the material. Uh, my name is Scott Stoller, and I've been an electrical mentor on Taters for seven going on eight years now. Um, I was originally a student on FRC Team 2468 uh, on their rookie year back in 2008. Um, I volunteer with the Idaho Regional Planning Committee, and I've uh, volunteered in various capacities from FTAA to a uh, control system advisor and the robot inspector, and really enjoy volunteering in those different capacities. Um, currently, I'm an electrical engineer at Micron Technology. I work on our flash memory um, and our enterprise SSD storage solutions. Um, and then, Jess, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Jess Tate, uh, also electrical mentor on Team Taters uh, since 2013. Um, before that, I was a student on our University of Portland robotics team. Uh, we competed in the NASA Lunabotics competition back in 2011 and 2012. Um, I'm also an electrical engineer working at uh, Micron in Boise, and I work on DRAM. Um, I was in product engineering for a while, and now I'm doing circuit design. Uh, during this presentation, I will be trying to answer any questions in the, the Q&A. Yep. Thanks, Jess. Uh, great. So uh, we have a couple of primary goals for this presentation. Um, really, the primary purpose, we want to give kind of a broad overview of electrical topics. So. Uh, we hope to provide a, a good introduction for new students uh, and then a review of topics uh, that experienced students will also find interesting here. So um, along the way, we have uh, some highlighted knowledge. So if we feel something's really important or particularly valuable, it's highlighted in green. Um, we also have a lot of links throughout the presentation. So there are different resources um, that can provide additional information and uh, in order to make this presentation accessible, we, we have a tiny URL here. So um, hopefully, if you're if you're watching live or if it's recorded, um, the the URL here should work. You can find these slides and and access all of these links for the additional information that we've linked. Um, so today we're going to go over uh, several different topics. We're going to talk through the Robo Rio and the control system overview. We'll spend quite a bit of time there. Um, we also want to talk about motor controllers and some of the different motor controllers that that we use. Um, discuss sensors a little bit. Um, review electrical connectors, and then um, we also want to do, we have like a top 10 countdown, so an electrical system robustness tip, so helping you guys keep that robot powered on and connected to the field during matches. Um, finally, we have a slide with some additional resources and, and links, and then we'll have, um, I think, 15 minutes at the end here for Q&A. Uh, so let's start with the Robo Rio overview. So, um, the Robo Rio, you can see here in this, this schematic from WPI Lib. Um, Robo Rio really is the heart and brains of the control system here. It's connected to just about every component in the control system. So um, we're going to go through and talk about kind of what some of those connections are, how it's connected, and, and how we use it. Um, so, what is the Robo Rio? It's the main controller or it's the brains of your robot. So, it runs your robot code and it interfaces with all of the other control system components. Um, you can see the, the schematic or the layout here with all of the different types of connections that it has, um, everything from, you know, PWM control, analog inputs, you know, digital I.O. inputs and outputs, um, and then several special um, communications buses as well. So we're going to talk a little bit through uh, all of that today. Um, the first thing we want to go through on the Robo Rio, we want to talk about the status LEDs on the Robo Rio. This is um, one of the most important things we use, we look at the status LEDs a lot when we're trying to debug issues on the Robo Rio. Um, they're, they're really important. They can communicate your robot states. There are six status lights. Um, power obviously indicates if the Robo Rio is powered on. Um, status can indicate kind of the status or the mode of the Robo Rio. Um, the, the radio LED here, actually, it's currently not used. Um, there's a comm LED. That comm LED will, will will indicate if you're connected to the driver's station or not. That can be useful when you're debugging 
um, connection issues. Uh, mode indicates the, the robot mode. Is it in teleop or autonomous mode? Um, and then the RSL indicates the robot status. It's, it actually mirrors the robot signal light, which, which plugs into the port here. Um, but that can tell you, is the robot powering up? Is it active or, or is, it, uh, is it enabled or disabled? Uh, the RoboRio has digital input and output ports. So uh, DIO or digital input output. Uh, we have 10 built-in DIO ports over here on the left side. Um, and then the MXP port right here actually uh, has even more uh, DIO ports. So if you have an expander board, um, that, that can expand the number of DIO ports uh, even more. The digital IO port has three pins. It has S, V, and then this symbol, this special symbol for ground. So S is, is your signal. V is your power or five volts. Um, and then ground is your zero volts or ground reference. Um, so all of these digital IO ports function at five volts. So when you're selecting sensors, um, you need to be careful. You want to use sensors that are that, that operate at, at five volts. Um, or if they don't, then you'll need to um, you'll need to do some kind of level shifting in order to to properly use those sensors. Um, one important thing to note, uh, especially when you're selecting sensors, is that the the digital IO ports have built-in pull-up resistors on that signal pin. So when you're selecting a sensor, you need to select a sensor that will, uh, when enabled, or when, when the sensor is, is uh, not sensing, it allows that pin to float up to five volts. When it is sensing, it pulls that pin down to zero volts in order to properly use, um, in order to take advantage of these. Um, so there's a little more information at all these links as well. Um, I know we're going, pretty quick, but again, keeping that high level overview. And if you have questions, uh, definitely, you know, ask in the chat or at the end, we'll have that Q&A session. Uh, analog inputs. So we have four analog inputs down here. Um, and again, more analog inputs available if you're using the MXP expander board. Uh, just like the digital IO ports, we have a signal uh, power or five volts and a ground pin. So uh, there's a common theme here, a common trend. Um, the analog ports, um, so, so the digital ports, they measure a voltage that's either kind of a one or a zero. So it's either you know zero volts or five volts. The analog inputs, by comparison, they measure um, a value that's anywhere between zero and five volts. So you could measure zero volts, one volt, two volts, or five volts, or anything in between. Um, the, the Robo Rio has a 12-bit DAC or 12-bit resolution. Um, and so that means you can actually measure uh, over 4,000 different values. Um, so within a five volt range, you get a, a resolution something about 1.2 millivolts. So um, that, that seems really precise. It actually is, uh, note the actual accuracy. If you go read that uh, Robo Rio user manual, it's about 50 millivolts. Um, but that analog voltage is really useful for um, you know, a potentiometer or an absolute encoder where you have an analog output from a sensor that tells you a, a relative position. Um, finally, we have over here, uh, kind of rounding out these three pin ports, uh, we have the PWM outputs. So we have 10 built-in PWM ports. Um, each of these ports, again, three pins. The pins are slightly different this time. Uh, we still have a signal pin and that's the PWM digital output with the five volt output. Um, there's also a power pin, which is a six volt output, and that's the power output for servos. So if you use a servo on your robot, um, that'll provide the power uh, for the servo. Um, and then of course there's the ground pin again. Um, so the PWM outputs, uh, some teams use none of them, some teams use them a lot. Uh, if you use them for if you're using servos, you'll use these PWM outputs. Um, and if you're, or if you're using uh, motor controllers that support PWM or some of the motor controllers uh, just natively support PWM or only support PWM. Um, so if you're running a motor controller that supports PWM, you'll probably need to use these outputs as well. So. All right, uh, the CAN bus, so we're getting into some of the different uh, buses now. Um, so these were, you know, simple input outputs. Um, 
the the CAN bus now CAN stands for controller area network and it's actually uh, was originally designed for use in, in automotive products um, so a lot of your vehicles modern vehicles use CAN protocol to communicate between different parts of the vehicle um, but what this bus does it allows a microcontroller to communicate with peripheral devices so in this case the microcontroller is the robo rio and the peripheral devices would be uh, a motor controller or your pdp or your pcm your pneumatics control module um, so this uh, so the can bus allows you to communicate with all of these peripheral devices which are the rest of the control system components so pdp pcm vrm motor controllers um, and other components sometimes uh, sometimes there are sensors or other components that support the can protocol um, and we'll get in a little more yep into the wiring here um, so the can wiring we can see we use since it's not a power or a ground signal um, but it's actually a communication signal uh, traditionally we'd use the yellow and green wires for can wiring um, so you can see the wide Mueller connections here um, using the uh, basically the yellow and green wires you connect the yellow and green wires directly into this connector um, and you can see it's upside down here but uh, you can see that l is for the green wire and, and h is for the yellow wire here um, when we connect our can bus um, we recommend using ferrules um, especially if you're using stranded can bus wire and we'll talk about ferrules uh, when we get to the electrical connectors in a little bit um, but yeah the the CAN bus that starts always needs to start at your Robo Rio um, and then daisy chained to all of your other components. So your components are going to be daisy chained together in one long daisy chain. And then um, at the very end, you need to make sure to properly terminate that connection. Um, so either using the built in termination on, on your uh, power distribution panel or using a 120 ohm resistor for that termination. Um, so the I2C bus is known as I squared C. What it actually stands for is inter-integrated circuit bus. Um, so it's used to communicate with uh, sensors and peripheral devices. So um, often for I2C, it might be used to communicate with a gyroscope or um, some other sensor like that. Um, it's worth noting that the MXP port actually gives you an additional I2C and it's an additional independent uh, I squared C bus. So um, you actually get two I squared, two separate I squared C buses uh, on the Robo Rio. Um, when you're wiring this up, usually the usually the I two C devices will just wire or plug directly in. But sometimes it might be necessary to create your own connector or wire them in. So you have to look at the the corresponding pins, and it shows you know obviously it shows the layout here. Um, and so you'll have to be sure when you're wiring this in that you wire the correct corresponding pins in um, when you're wiring in a peripheral device. Um, similarly, we also have the SPI bus. Uh, SPI is the Serial Peripheral Interface bus. Um, and again, it communicates with different sensors and different peripheral devices. Um, and again, just like the I squared C bus, the, uh, the MXP port gives us an additional independent SPI bus as well. Um, so the SPI bus protocol, it operates a little bit differently than I2C. You can see I2C only has four pins, um, and the SPI bus here, we have 10 different pins. Um, and so it's just the difference in protocol, the difference in the way that it communicates with those peripheral devices. Um, and again, if you're plugging a device in, they'll either plug directly into this connector, um, or one, one thing that we commonly use is we actually, um, uh, often the MXP boards, um, for example, like the um, NAVX MXP board actually plugs directly into the MXP port here. And the NAVX contains a gyro on it. And that gyro is basically already hooked up so that it's, it's communicating over the SPI bus to the Robo Rio when you plug it in. Um, so it's already pre-configured or, or set up to communicate over the SPI bus that way. Um, but, you know, examples of devices that use the SPI bus, right, the analog devices, that's a gyro, um, or the NAVX board, which has the, the three axis gyro on it.
use the spy bus. Um, and I've been talking about the MXP expansion port the whole time. Um, so we already have some idea of what it does. Uh, but again, it provides the additional digital and analog input inputs and outputs. Um, and it gives you that extra I squared C bus and that spy bus. Um, there are uh, a lot of commercial off the shelf MXP boards that plug directly into this port. Um, you, one thing about the MXP boards is there is a, a list of pre-approved active boards. So if there's a board that has active components on it, that board has to be pre-approved by the rules committee or the game design committee um, in order to be used. If you have a passive board, meaning that you don't have any active components, so like you don't have any integrated circuits or anything like that on the board, um, then you can use any custom board that you would like, as long as there are passive components on it. Um, so that's one thing to note. There's more information, obviously, about the MXP port at the link here. Um, and there's additional information, I think. Yeah, we have a list of boards. So we have a couple of example boards that we show here. Um, and there's a complete list of the active boards that are approved for FRC in the game manual. In the 2021 game manual, it was rule 69. Um, for the 22, 2022 game manual, you have to look up the rule, um, but it'll probably be within, it'll be close to this rule. It'll be one of the R rules because uh, R rules are for robot. Um, two of the different boards that we have personally used, we've used the Rev More board. Um, the More board is a completely passive board. Um, so if you look at this board, there are no active components on it. Um, everything is just passive wiring on this board. It's, it's kind of hard to tell that. Um, but compared to the Nav X2 board, uh, which we've also used, that has the, uh, the IMU or basically the gyro plus, um, basically the gyro unit on it. Um, but that gyro unit is an active component. Um, you can see the active components here, right? We have an integrated circuit on the board, um, some transistors, it looks like, some LEDs that light, light up. Um, so a lot of active components on this board, that NAVX2 is an example of the board that has to be pre-approved for use um, under the, in the game manual. Um, so let's get into something a little bit different. So we've gone through a lot of the different communication protocols. Um, let's talk about RoboRio power. Um, so the power terminal, you can see the very top left here, it uses this connector that's called a SORO connector, uh, S-A-U-R-O. Um, it's kind of hard to say. Um, we're not really big fans of the connector. Um, one of the reasons that we really dislike this connector is because the screw terminals, specifically these terminals here that hold your wires in, tend to loosen over time, especially when you use them in FRC. You're bouncing around on the field, you're running over things, you're hitting other robots, those screws can come loose over time. Um, and, and so one thing that we do when we are at competitions is we periodically remove the connector and retighten these screws. Um, when you're connecting the power here, um, obviously you can see on the connector, there's a V and a C. So V would be voltage, that's your 12 volt input. And then C is, is for common, which is your ground. Um, so that'd be your, your black wire. Um, you can see that we've highlighted here um, in, in the blue dotted lines here, uh, the two wide Mueller connectors on the PDP are where we plug in the other end of the power connectors for the Robo Rio. Um, and then you need to make sure that you have the 10 amp fuse populated for the Robo Rio as well on the power distribution panel. All right, so that's that's the Robo Rio. Um, we also wanted to cover some of the other control system components a little bit. Um, now the Robo Rio communicates almost communicates with all the components. Um, obviously the battery doesn't have a, uh, a CAN bus, so we don't communicate with the battery directly, um, but the RoboRio actually kind of indirectly communicates with the battery because um, the, the RoboRio gets power measurements and, or voltage measurements and current measurements from the PDP that tell the RoboRio things about how charged the battery still is, things like that. Um, so the battery here, you can see we've got a picture of it. Um, the battery is the power source of your robot. Um, so the battery, we have battery leads that come off of the battery terminals here. They connect to the main breaker. Um, the batteries, um, you know, with, with all the really powerful brushless motors, 
um, and the power distribution panels, um, you, you know, we can have like 12 motors running. Um, and so these batteries run out really quickly. They're not, um, they're not very well suited to deliver 120 amps of current for more than a couple minutes. Um, so matches last two and a half minutes. Um, and so the battery will be, especially if you have a robot that has a really heavy drivetrain or, or a competition game where you're doing a lot of pushing and, and fighting other robots, um, batteries do run out. You'll run them down by the end of the match. Um, one thing that we do suggest is buying a, a battery beak um, and using that to keep charge of or keep track of the charge on your battery. Make sure every match you're using a, a good battery. Um, there is a list of, of legal batteries, obviously. You can't go buy any battery you want. Um, Rule 32 in 2021 uh, gave you a list of which batteries are FRC legal. Um, and really what it is, is any battery that's a, a 12 volt battery and 18 amp hours um, is pretty much legal, but the, the full explicit list is in the, in the uh, rule book. One big thing that we, uh, we really want to emphasize here, I think, on batteries is uh, the leads on them, making sure that the leads are secure on the battery. Um, so making sure that basically the bolts that connect to the, the, the leads to the battery lugs are tight. Um, and then making sure that battery is secure on the robot. Batteries are really heavy. And so if you're, you know, driving full speed and hit another robot or hit a wall, that battery has a lot of inertia. Um, and so it's easy for it to, to pop out of your robot or fall out and, and disconnect. So um, definitely securing your battery is, is important as well. Uh, all right, so your main breakers, this is uh, basically in between the battery and your power distribution panel on your robot. Um, and it really is kind of the on off switch to the robot. Um, you can see here the red button, pushing that red button will turn it off. Um, it basically slides out this little piece right here. Um, and then pushing that piece back in will turn the breaker back on. It'll uh, power up your robot. Um, again, make sure you tighten your leads um, and make sure that you watch for rule uh, 43 here. Um, making sure that that breaker is readily accessible. And that's really for to protect people on the field. If, um, if your robot is out of control for some reason or loses communication or leaves the field, uh, field staff need to be able to turn the robot off and disable it quickly and easily. So, um, so next kind of in the line of, of power distribution is the power distribution panel. Um, so it's the main power interface. So you can see down here the, the um, six gauge wires from your battery and your main breaker come in here. So plus for the red wire, minus is for your ground or your black wire here. Um, and then it has uh, 16 ports, port zero through 15, um, 16 ports to distribute power to other components uh, on your robot. Um, now this is the first component that actually connects directly to the Robo Rio as well. Um, and that uses the CAN interface. And you can see the CAN uh, interface right here. There are four ports, two for input, two for output. Um, and then the special part right here is the termination resistor. So um, the Robo Rio, if it's the last, uh, the last component in, that in the CAN bus uh, in the chain, um, you can put that termination resistor on and it's built in already. You don't have to solder in an extra 120 ohm resistor somewhere in the line or at the very last one. So it's really convenient to put the PDP as the very last one in the, in the CAN chain, very last device. Um, the, um, some of the features of the power distribution panel when it's connected to the CAN bus, it reports things like the uh, temperature of the board or the voltage of the battery. Um, you can get current draw for the total robot. You can get current draw for each of these ports actually. So if you have one motor that's drawing a lot more current than another, you can kind of go and, and, and say, maybe that motor is broken or you know maybe we geared that motor wrong or something like that. Um, again, we can't emphasize it enough. Make sure your leads are tightened. It's really important to get good contact there so you don't, um, you get the most power you can from your battery. If you have loose contacts, um, obviously it can cause you to lose power to your Robo Rio or your radio if it's really loose um, or if it's just a little bit loose, it, it, You'll you'll lose voltage there. Um, it'll be a resistive contact. You'll 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 uh, 
uh, brown out more easily. Um, and then of course, it's nice to have the, the PDP accessible. Um, if you're like us, we're constantly adding new mechanisms or switching motors around. So we like to have it accessible anyways. Um, and the rules state that the robot inspector has to be able to uh, see the power distribution panel in order to inspect it and make sure that your, your breakers are the correct size and correct rating and things like that. Um, so fuses and breakers. So uh, we can see in the power distribution panel, uh, these slots or these holes, and those are where the breakers get inserted for each channel. Um, so what is a fuse or a breaker? It really is, well, it's, it's a fuse or a breaker, but the purpose is to protect your wiring from an overcurrent situation. Um, so, so what it really does is if, if a motor starts to draw too much current, the breaker will turn off power to that motor. It'll break the circuit. Um, and so that can prevent the motor from burning up or protect your wiring. Um, so um, the breaker size here, we, we say it determines the minimum wire gauge. And this is again, rule in the, in, in the game manual. Um, but for a 40 amp breaker, you can run 12 gauge wire. Um, for a 30 amp breaker, 14 gauge wire, a 20 amp breaker, 18 gauge wire. Um, and again, the, the wire gauge determines what the breaker rating needs to be. Um, so smaller gauge wire is thinner. It can handle less current before it gets too warm or burns up. Um, and so that's why you have a, a smaller breaker for the smaller wire here. Uh, the voltage regulation module um, or the VRM. So the VRM is powered by a dedicated port on the power distribution panel, and it gives you a 12 volt and a five volt regulated voltage supply. So this is really cool because what that means is that even if your battery volt, e even if the robot is browning out, or your battery voltage, um, you know, if you're in a pushing match with another robot, that battery voltage droops down to seven or eight volts. This is gonna give you a constant 12 volt and constant five volt output, um, which, is, which is really cool. Um, and this is really useful obviously because um, you want your radio. This, this, this is the component that powers your, your uh, radio. Um, and so you want your radio to have, um, you want your radio to be uh, not to you know to have that constant output supply or that regulated voltage output. Um, so there are two different channels. So on the five volt over here, you can see a five volt two amp, and then a five volt five hundred milliamp or half amp. Um, and then the same thing on the twelve volt twelve volt two amp, and then the twelve volt five hundred milliamp. Um, there are two status LEDs here that'll tell you if the twelve volt supply is enabled and the five volt supply is is good. Um, and so all the time, you know, both of these lights should be on all the time, hopefully. Um, one note is that the 12 volt two amp channels must be dedicated for the radio. Um, and then the other channel can be a, a custom circuit. Um, all the connectors on here, again, are the wide Mueller connectors. So we recommend using ferrules and we'll get to ferrules when we get to the electrical connections a little bit later. Uh, so your pneumatic control module, so the, the PCM. Um, so the PCM is only required, it, it's not uh, a mandatory device. You don't always have to have a PCM on your robot, but if you're gonna run pneumatics or air power on your robot, you need to have it. Um, it's the only component that, the, that can control um, a, a pneumatics, um, pneumatic solenoids on your robot. Um, so you can see over here we have CAN, so it's, it's, it communicates with the RoboRio via CAN. Um, you can also see that there's a compressor output on it uh, and a pressure, pressure switch. Um, the compressor output uh, obviously powers your air compressor, and then that, compress, that pressure switch input will automatically turn off your air compressor when you reach uh, 120 PSI on, on your storage tanks. Um, you have eight outputs total, so output zero through seven. Um, and so that means that you can run eight single-ended or four double-ended. So each double-ended solenoid actually requires two outputs um, in order to function. A single-ended solenoid only requires one output. Um, when you're selecting solenoids to use, make sure you select all 12 volt or all 24 volt, volt solenoids. Um, don't mix and match. Um, if you mix and match them, uh, if, if you have a 12 volt solenoid and you're running a 24 volts on your jumper here, uh, you're gonna burn your solenoids up. 
if you're running a 24 volt solenoid and you only have a 12 volt uh, on, the, on the jumper here, your solenoids won't work, won't function properly. Um, so you always need to match the, the jumper setting with the solenoids and then don't mix and match 12 volt and 24 volt solenoids. Uh, all right, let's talk a little bit about the radio. So the radio is, is the main means of communication between your robot and your driver station. So um, when, when you're doing drive practice at the school or, or wherever you practice, you're gonna connect via Wi-Fi directly to, from your driver station to your radio. When you're doing, uh, when you're at an event and you're on the field, you're gonna connect your driver station to the field and then the field is gonna connect directly to your radio, which is, connect is, which is connected to the Robo Rio. Um, so when you're connecting at the field, um, you, you, you add an event, uh, in order for your radio to properly connect to the field, um, you have to configure the radio at the event. So, um, at the driver's meeting, they'll talk to you about how to do that. Um, but usually there's a, a PC, a dedicated PC, um, either by the FTA's table or by the robot inspection table or the control system advisor table. Where, where you can uh, basically take your robot, plug your radio in, and it'll image it and, and configure it properly for that event. Um, there are a lot of different status lights on the radio. So we have just a quick image that shows what the light uh, shows the different lights and it kind of shows what they mean here. Um, and it's a good idea when you're when you're doing your when you're figuring out where to place the radio on your robot. Um, it's a good idea to try to make sure those uh, lights are visible. Um, you want them. You want them to be visible. Um, that way, it's easy for field staff. If your robot dies on the field, or if your robot is having communication issues on the field, it's it's always a good idea for that radio to be visible to field staff, um, so they can help you debug and troubleshoot some of those issues. Uh, so when you're wiring that radio, um, so the radio connects to the Ethernet from the Robo Rio um, and, and the rules specify which port the Robo Rio needs to be connected to. It's this 18 to 24 volt PoE port. Um, the other ethernet port could be used to connect to a coprocessor like a Raspberry Pi, um, or if you're using a Limelight for vision, something like that. Um, so the other ethernet port could be connected to a different coprocessor or a different device. Um, for radio power, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, that 12 volt, two amp max, um, or that 12 volt, two amp port on the voltage regulator module is what powers your, uh, needs to power your radio. And again, that's in the rules. Um, so the rules tell you that it, which port to plug it into. Um, now, one thing that we like to do when we, uh, when we plug in our radio, we like to make sure our power delivery is redundant. So, um, we power our radio with both a PoE injector and the barrel plug adapter. Um, and you notice that there are two different, um, or there are four ports, but they're, they're two different plugs, right? Two different pairs of plugs. Um, and so that allows you to do that. So one of these can get plugged into the PoE injector, um, which plugs into this ethernet port here. And then the other can go plugged into a, a barrel jack connector, which gets plugged into the barrel jack here. So we get redundant we're extra certain that our radio is never going to be unplugged during a match. Um, and we're never, never going to get a, a, ra a radio reboot or lose communication on the field. Um, it's also good to check that that barrel plug is securely held in place. Um, so you can, you know, uh, tape it in if you want to, something like that. Uh, and then finally, that brings us to the robot signal light. So it's not, it, it's kind of a control system component. Um, it maybe is the most important one of the most important com components on the robot because it's um, a safety component. So the robot signal light, it indicates the status of your robot. Um, so it'll tell you when the robot is on and disabled or when it's on and enabled or when the robot is off. Um, and so this is really important because um, you never wanna work on your robot when the robot is on and especially not when it's on and enabled. Um, so if your robot is on and enabled, you see that light blinking, that's a signal immediately you should know, you know, don't put your hands in there, stay away from the robot, it could move at any time. Um, so it definitely, uh, it might be the last in the list here, but it's definitely, I, I think, the most important component because it's uh, safety related here. Um, 
So that brings us now to the motor controllers. So again, these are still control system components, um, but motor controllers are really special because uh, they have a special task here. So what does the motor controller do? Well, it controls a motor. That's not very descriptive, right? Um, but what it really does is providing a variable output power to drive the motor, and it can provide that in either a forward or reverse direction. So it lets you drive a motor at any power that you want and any direction that you want. Um, so it's really, really important for the mechanical movement of your robot on the field. Um, so the RoboRio communicates with the motor controllers uh, using either a PWM or CAN signals. Um, and what's neat is the, um, you know, all of our control system components, they all have lights and indicators for the most part. Um, the motor controllers, they're no different. Um, so the LED lights you can see on the Victor SPX over here and on the right side there, or on the uh, Spark Max, there's an LED here. Those LEDs will light up and they'll give you important information about what the device is doing. Is it driving in the forward direction or the reverse direction and how much power? Um, and if there's, if there's a fault on the controller or, or an error on the controller, it can indicate that as well. Um, so there's a lot more information there. And I know at the end, we have a, uh, a link to the, the LED status indicators table as well. Um, so motor controller choices. So we have two more motor controllers that we've shown here. Um, so you've seen images now of the four primary motor controller choices. So um, you have like the Victor SPX, a Spark Max, there's a Talon SRX, and then there's the Falcon 500, which is actually an integrated controller and motor all in one. Um, we have two brushed motor controllers. So the Talon SRX and the Victor SPX, um, those are the brushed motor controllers. Um, and then there are two brushless motor controllers um, the Rev Spark Max, which can power the Neo motors, um, and then the Falcon, the, the Talon FX and the Falcon 500 is an integrated motor plus controller there. Um, one thing to note, the, the Spark Max is a brushless motor controller, but it can also power brushed motors as well. Um, so it's very flexible, um, really a cool motor controller. Um, these are the primary four controllers. Um, there are probably seven or eight other legal motor controllers, but they're pretty much obsolete or superseded by these four. Um, so they're, they're either really old or they don't support CAN, um, things like that. So um, these are the primary four controllers. All of them support CAN um, and all of them are flexible and can support PWM control as well. Um, so just a quick breakdown or comparison. Um, we can see up here that all of them support CAN. The Spark Max is kind of special because it has the USB port as well. Um, so you can plug it in directly to a computer and configure it using that USB port. So that's kind of neat. Um, like we mentioned, the SRX, the Talon SRX and the Victor SPX, those are brushed only. The Spark Max can do brushed or brushless motors. Um, and then the Falcon 500, is, it, it, it's brushless only. It's integrated with that motor. Um, now the Talon SRX is pretty cool because it has a data port that's built in. So you can get limit switches or encoder feedback and it has built-in feedback control. Um, and, and the cross the road electronics uh, code libraries and, and support for the Talon SRX is really powerful and really good. Um, so we, we like using the Talon SRXs. Now the, the Victor SPX, there's no data port, um, but it's also a lot cheaper than the Talon SRX. So for that reason, it's very cost-effective um, we really like the Victor SPX as well. Um, now the Spark Max is really neat, right? It does brushed or brushless motors. It also has a built-in data port similar to the Talon SRX. Um, and it has that built-in feedback control as well. Um, we kind of think that that's the most versatile controller. It can do everything. If you're gonna buy one controller and you don't know if you're doing brushed or brushless motors, that Spark Max is definitely very versatile. Um, and then finally, the Falcon 500. So the Falcon 500 is the integrated solution for motor and controller. Um, it doesn't have a built-in data port, but it has a built-in encoder because it's that brushless motor. It's integrated directly with the brushless motor. And the brushless motor, in order to function, has to have an encoder built in. Um, so you still get the, the built-in encoder functionality from that motor. Um, it's the most expensive on the list but you're getting a motor and controller for that price. Um, so it's kind of cool because it's just one single component, one single solution. 
um, it, it can help reduce, it, it can potentially make your system more robust because you don't have a bunch of extra wires and cables between your controller and your motor. Um, so when you're wiring up motors and controllers in your robot, um, so your controllers, you have two input power wires um, for power. So you have your 12 volt and your ground, those connect to the power distribution panel. And then you have a, normally a green and yellow wire. Um, and those are for the CAN bus, although those inputs also work as PWM. Um, some of the controllers, like we mentioned, they have an additional port where you can plug in limit switches or encoders. Um, and so you can look at the documentation for those motor controllers to uh, understand a little bit more about how to wire those up or um, how, to, uh, how to interface with those ports. Um, when, we're, when we connect or when we're running power to motors and to motor controllers, we really like using the Anderson power pole connectors because it's really easy to plug and unplug and swap out components. Um, we're, we're modifying our robot late in the season. We're doing a lot of component swaps. If you're not doing component swaps uh, late in the season or things like that, maybe you don't need the Andersons, but we like them. Um, often if we, oops, if we can, we often try to plug the uh, wires the power wires from the rate from the um, motor controllers directly into the power distribution panel. Um, and again, um, you know, if you're uncertain of which motor controllers are legal, um, in 2021, it was Rule 29 um, or R29 in the game manual that would tell us which motor controllers are legal, which are not legal. Um, so when you're wiring a brushed controller like the Victor or the Talon, um, you only have two wires that go to your motor. So the green and the white wires are your motor, your, your negative and your positive wires for the motor. Um, and those connect to the red and black wires on your motor. Those are really simple to hook up. Um, now, when you're connecting a brushless motor, you can see the brushless motor like the Neo here has three wires for the brushless motor. So you've got to connect A, B, and C, which are red, black, and white to the red, black, and white motor or, uh, wires on that Neo controller. In addition, there's an encoder wire from the brushless motor that has to be plugged into the, into the controller uh, port as well. Um, so you have really four wires and that's, just, that's, that's actually a bus, but really it's four connections that you have to connect for those brushless motors when you're using the Spark Max. Um, obviously the Falcon 500, that's an integrated all-in-one solution. Um, so you just connect that thing to power and into your control system, either with PWM or CAN, and you're all set. Uh, the motor is already connected up to the controller because it's it's one unit. Um, so we're getting pretty close on time. We're going to go through sensors pretty quickly here, and then we'll do our top ten robustness countdown. Um, so what are sensors? They're not required, but if you want to have effective robot control, if if you want to be able to control precise movements on your robot, you really need to use them. Um, so. Some of, the re some of the ways that sensors are useful, they, they can sense you know, your robot position on the field, how far you've driven, how fast you're driving, um, you know, what the angle is on an arm moving up and down, things like that. Um, you also can sense other things like game pieces or maybe parts of the field, like how far am I from a wall? Um, I don't know, maybe other robots. Um, so one of, the, one of the most basic sensors that we use uh, on every robot we build is encoders. So there are two types of encoders, incremental encoders and absolute encoders. Um, and the link here has uh, a lot of good information on the differences between the encoders. Um, really an incremental encoder, what it does is it gives you a number of clicks or pulses for a revolution. So it's really good for measuring distance or measuring speed. Um, an absolute encoder gives you a, a voltage output, an analog output. So sometimes it's called an analog encoder. Um, but it gives you an output that is basically the rotational position of the encoder. Um, so an incremental encoder known as a, a quadrature encoder, um, it requires two digital inputs on the Robo Rio. Um, and those inputs are usually offset by some phase. Um, and, and so that gives you basically a, a velocity and a, or a speed and a direction. Um, the increment enco incremental encoder is... Um, is really neat because the way that they work. Um, so they have basically this wheel inside and it's got slots in it. 
um, or, or holes in it, and then you have a light source that's shining through these uh, these slots, they go to a signal converter, and that signal converter it basically uses the the ticks or the light sources here um, as they either shine through the slots or they're blocked um, to generate output signals that can show you um, that basically give you counts. So as the road as the encoder uh, shaft rotates, that disk rotates, um, and it and it gives you an output. Uh, on your output signals that can tell you both how far you've gone so you can count the number of ticks to know how far you've gone and then if your direction um, so if a leads if, if basically if channel a rises before channel b you know you're going in one direction if you reverse the direction channel b will rise before channel a that tells you you're moving the other direction um, so the incremental encoders are really good on like a drive train where we want to know how far we've, we've driven we count the number of ticks. We want to want to know how fast we're going. We we count um, basically how quickly are these ticks coming in. What's the time between the rising edge of the ticks? Um, the absolute encoder or increment or, or um, it gives you an analog voltage output. So it's also known as an analog encoder. Um, what it does is basically when it's when that's at when the encoder is at zero degrees. It'll give you an output of zero volts. When it's at 359 degrees, it'll give you an output of five volts. And then when it wraps back around to zero again, it goes back to zero volts. Um, so this is really a good, good encoder for looking at rotational position, like the angle of an arm. Um, it's not very good at measuring distance or velocity. You could, uh, it, it's just not, not ideal for that case. Um, and what you can see here, we've kind of included uh, just a graph that shows like voltage versus the position of the encoder. So you start at zero volts at zero degrees, you go all the way up to your five volts at 360 degrees, and then it wraps back around to zero again. Um, and, and the way that the absolute encoder works is kind of like the incremental encoder. There are basically slots or markings on a disk. Um, and so every, every angle on that disk has a unique marking essentially. Um, and so there's a controller in there that can read those markings and basically output the correct voltage that corresponds to the markings or the position on that disk. Um, and again, the, the link on one of the previous slides provides a really good output or a really good comparison and explanation of, of how that works. Um, there are some other sensors that we use as well. Um, we like using proximity sensors. So some proximity sensors might be like an ultrasonic sensor. Um, or the photoelectric sensor, like we have um, a retro reflective up here that bounces light off of a target, a through beam model with like a transmitter and a receiver when that target blocks the signal going back, um, that sensor will tell you. Um, and then a um, retro reflective as well, um, which is kind of like the through beam model bounces, it, it emits the light, bounces it off of a reflector, um, and then bounces it back um, when that light is beam is broken, then it says, oh, a game piece or, or whatever you're trying to sense is in the way. Um, there are inductive sensors that sense metal, Hall effect sensors that can sense magnetic um, or, or a, a change in an electric field. Uh, capacitive sensors are really neat because they can sense non-metallic um, surfaces or non-metallic things like plastic or wood. Um, and then your simple limit switch. Um, so a lot of these sensors, they limit robot motion. Um, you might home a device to a known position uh, or use it to track game pieces. So you might know, okay, I, 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 you know, on your intake, I sucked this game piece up. I know where it is. I can stop driving my motors now. Um, there's also some positioning sensors. So we talked a little bit about the gyroscope um, and the accelerometer, um, specifically the NAVX board um, or, or the analog devices gyro. Um, so these are cool. The, the gyro can tell you things like um, uh, basically change in angle. So if your robot is starting to tilt or if you're turning your robot, it'll give you that kind of orientation information. Um, an accelerometer tells you acceleration in one direction. So if you're driving forward or stopping, it'll tell you the acceleration and you can get an idea. You can actually use that acceleration information to have some idea of how far your robot has traveled. Um, there's also cameras, so you can get um, computer vision processing, like the limelight, um, sensing off of the reflective tape, things like that. A um, couple other sensors, 
Um, last year, we had a color sensor for the color wheel. That was kind of neat. Um, there's pressure sensors, tilt sensors, touch sensors, um, your simple limit switch here. Um, plenty of examples from Andy Mark as well. So um, all kinds of really cool sensors to sense anything you want. Um, all right, so electrical connectors. Um, there's several electrical connectors we wanted to go through here. Um, we'll start with the Anderson SB50. This is the main connector between your robot battery and your robot. Um, so this is, most teams use the SB50. Um, basically, uh, it plugs your robot battery into your, into your power distribution panel or into your breaker. Um, there's also an SB120 connector. It's bigger than this. Um, some teams use it, but it's uncommon. Um, so that's the SB50. Uh, the battery lugs, these are just battery lugs that go into the screw type terminals on your battery, on your power distribution panel, on your main breaker. Um, it's really important to verify when you use these lugs that they're tight. Um, and we recommend using the correct crimping tool. We've tried soldering these and crimping with pliers and we've nothing works as well as the actually having the correct crimping tool for these lugs. So um, either buy them pre-crimped or uh, buy the correct crimping tool for battery lugs. Um, Anderson power poles, we talked a little bit about. This is what we like to use for our 12 gauge, 14 gauge, 18 gauge wire. Um, there are different sizes of power pole contacts. So when you're using 12 gauge or 14 gauge wire, make sure you're using the correct, con the, the correct power pole type, the PP30. If you're using 18 or 20 gauge wire, um, the PP15 works better. Um, just based on the wire size and, and ease of crimping. Um, the power poles, again, they, you crimp this metal connector on the end and then they slide into the plastic housing and it's really easy to plug and unplug them. Um, so really convenient for swapping out motors and components. Um, I've been talking about ferrules and, and the wide Mueller connectors the whole time. Ferrules are really useful. You can see the example of, of the ferrule here on the end of this wire. And what it really is useful for is it takes a stranded wire and it gives you a solid connector here. So you don't have to try and push a stranded wire into these wide Mueller connectors. Um, so it, it organizes and bunches all the strands. You don't have to worry about is a strand, you know, do I have strands that are still uh, stray strands that are not inserted all the way that could short two connections together, things like that. Um, and again, the ferrule, it requires a special crimping tool, um, but you can find the crimper, the, the ferrules and the crimping tools on Amazon. They're relatively cheap. We really like them because we feel that it improves the robustness of our electrical system. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to insert and remove these connectors from the wide Mueller connectors. Um, the wide Mueller connectors, they, they're these small connectors here. Um, to insert connections in, you just stick the wire in. You, to remove the connectors, you have to depress the white button here. Um, so you use a screwdriver or a special tool to depress that white button and then you can just pull the wire right out. Uh, the PDP Wago connectors. Um, so these are basically on, on the power distribution panel and they connect your 12 gauge or your 18 gauge wire to things like motor controllers or other components. Um, you can see the, the Wago connectors here, there's two slots. So there's one slot to put a Wago tool in or, or a screwdriver in and you wedge that tool in there and it'll open the metal gate in the round slot and you can stick your wire in there. Um, when you're doing this, you wanna make sure that you don't insert your wire too far and clamp on your wire insulation. Um, obviously you wanna clamp that metal gate in here on your copper wire. Um, that way you make a good contact to the Wago connector. Um, and then we have PWM connectors. These are signal level connectors. Um, so PWM connectors, they're used to connect uh, things like a PWM signal to a motor. Uh, you can see in the example here, or they're used to connect your CAN bus together, things like that. Um, the PWM connectors don't have good built-in retention, so they don't stay together. They're really easy to pull apart. So we recommend using like a retention clip um, or wrapping your connections with, with electrical tape in order to keep them held together. Um, and then there are various other ways to make connections as well. Uh, we have the SB120 connection up here. There's like a, a Wago brand splicing connector over here. You can solder things. Um, some teams use these. Uh, we don't. We've used the Wago splicing connectors in the past. They're nice. They're convenient and easy. Um, there are obviously a lot more different connectors than this as well. 
um, we kind of went through on the connector section what we use and what we like to use. All right, uh, and then finally, we have 10 tips to keep your robot reliable this season. So we're gonna go uh, rapid speed through here. Um, number 10, updated control system firmware. Um, you can find a list of the required software versions in the FRC game manual each year. Um, so save yourself time at your first event um, and do it at home. Update your control system firmware. Usually there's bug fixes or additional functionality that you get as well. Um, robust can wiring. Uh, the big thing is making sure it's always properly terminated. Um, we really like using the built-in termination on the power distribution panel that you can see over here. Uh, number eight, bundling and organizing our wires and the strain relief. So we like to use the flexible conduit you can see over here on the left. We use zip ties for strain relief and organizing wires. Um, and then for mechanisms that extend or retract, we really like using the IGUS chain for bundling and organizing our wires. Robo Rio power, we talked about this already once on the Robo Rio, making sure this power is robust, verifying that these screws are tight several times during every event. Um, it'll help you help prevent you from browning out or losing power to your, your Robo Rio and uh, getting Robo Rio reboots. Uh, again, robust radio wiring. We talked about it a little bit earlier. We like to do redundant wiring, so we have both the barrel jack and PoE powering our radio. Uh, PDP fuses and breakers. The the, the breakers. Uh, are really difficult to insert and really difficult to remove from the PDP. That's good. That means they're making a really good electrical connection. Uh, unfortunately, that means it's easy to think that you've inserted it when you haven't. Um, so it's always good to just double check these, make sure they're fully inserted into your power distribution panel. panel so you're getting the most uh, power you can to your components. Using a fresh battery every match. So we like using a battery beak. Um, the reading over the reading over here is probably for an FTC battery, like an eight volt battery, not an FRC battery. Um, but it gives you an idea. It gives you a, a status of the battery. It tells you, is it good or does it need to be charged? So um, when you're purchasing, if you purchase a battery beak, get the FRC version. It's designed for our 12 volt batteries. But this way we can make sure we always have a fresh battery every match. Uh, securing all of our electrical connectors. Um, we use the PWM retention clips. The power poles have a retention hole that you can run zip ties through to zip tie those connections together to make sure they won't unplug. Um, for, your main for your main battery wiring on your SB50, zip tying around the connector to make sure that that connector won't fall out. We've seen teams with zip tied battery connectors, battery falls out on the field and they're still running because they've got that zip tied in. So always a good idea to zip tie that connector. Um, Two, covering unused Robo Rio ports. So these ports, um, if you get, uh, you know, uh, metal shavings or swarf in these ports, um, <laughs> you know, you can short pins together. We, uh, in, in 2015, we missed like three matches in a row at one of our regionals because we had an aluminum shaving in one of these ports here. So um, using electrical tape to basically tape over and cover those ports, it prevents uh, all kinds of issues. So we always have those ports covered now. Um, we never run with them exposed anymore. Um, and then finally, your six gauge power wiring. So triple checking that wiring, making sure every, every lug is tightened. Um, this is probably the number one reason that robots die on the field, at least from what I've seen. Um, but you wanna be making sure those lugs are super tight. You don't wanna be able to wiggle them by hand um, and also, properly crimping those lugs. So that's that's our top 10 uh, countdown. We have a quick link to uh, just resources and links that we found helpful. Um, and thank you. So um, I think I didn't leave that much time for questions. I was supposed to leave 15 minutes, but um, I can stick around for 15 minutes. Um, I don't know. We definitely have some time for questions if anybody has some. So thank you, Scott and Jess, for uh, your participation here. Um, we're definitely going to be open a couple of minutes if any, anybody has questions. Um, so through the Q&A um, section, we will be receiving questions. If not, I think that would be it, but let's wait for a second. OK, so we do have one. It is from an anonymous viewer. 
Um, it says, we're a rookie team. Any comments on CIM motors? Um, I think so it is sim. sim motors. Sim. Yes, yeah. sim motors. Um, yeah, we have we've used sim motors in the past, um, almost exclusively on our drivetrain. They're very powerful and very robust. Um, they're a brushed motor. Um, so in recent, the last year or two, since we have had access to brushless motors, which are more powerful and more efficient, uh, our team has switched over to using the brushless motors almost exclusively, um, just because they give us more power um, and they're a little bit more efficient. Um, but the sim motor is definitely a good motor. Um, it, it's robust and it's very powerful. Um, and it works with the brushless motor controllers. So it's um, if you're on a budget um, or your team doesn't have much of a budget, it's definitely a great motor. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, it says, we're thinking on replacing all of our motors that we have um, for a Neo and a Falcon 500. Do you think it's all right? Um, so we've been running the Neo motors. We also have been, uh, we've been running the Neo motors on our comp, uh, competition robots. Um, and we think that they're reliable and robust. We like using them. Um, we've also been playing with the Falcon 500 motors and integrated controller on our, one of our off season robots this year. Um, and that's working well, uh, for us too. So I think, um, and there are a lot of veteran teams out there who are running both of these brushless motor options. So I think both are really good options. Um, the Falcon 500 is a little bit more powerful than the Neo. Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're both great options. Um, we've used them to replace SIM motors exclusively on our robots. So um, I, I wouldn't hesitate to use them. Okay, we have another one. Do you organize your electrical components in CAD? Uh, yeah, so when we do, uh, when we do our CAD layout, um, when we do the, um, the mechanical layout for a robot during the build season, um, we always have an electrical belly pan. Um, and so that belly pan is where we mount all of our electrical components. So the CAD models for the electrical components is available uh, on you know cross the road electronics for the CTR components, or Rev for the Rev components. Um, everybody you know wherever you can order those components, they have CAD models available. Um, and so when we're planning our electrical electrical system layout, um, we will use CAD to kind of figure out where we want to place those components, um, and then we'll transfer holes and use that to drill holes um, on our belly pan when we're fabricating it. So yeah. Um, we do that. Previously, we did it in SolidWorks. We're transitioning to Onshape this year. So we're going to be doing that in Onshape. But yeah, we, we organize them in CAD and, and do the layouts in CAD. Okay, and I think we have uh, the last question. What is the best way to secure the battery to the robot in case it would accidentally fall out of it? Um, yeah, so when we, when we secure our battery to the robot, that's, the, that's a big question for us. We like to place our battery um, low and in the center of our robot, so we have a low center of gravity, but it also has to be accessible so we can easily remove it and swap it out. Um, what we often end up doing is we build a battery box. So we'll use aluminum angle or aluminum sheet and bend it to make a battery box that our, our battery can, uh, base, that we can set our battery into or slide the battery into. And then um, we use a webbing or a strap uh, in order to clip the battery in. Um, so almost like, um, yeah, uh, it's just a webbing and a clip. And so we'll actually clip the battery in and secure it that way so that it can't move um, and can't fall out. But yeah, that's one of the biggest, um, biggest you know, one of the biggest challenges of figuring out where to put the battery and how do we keep it as secure as we can. Okay, and I think we've got another one. Uh, yep. should, we be, should we be careful with putting the components next to each other? Um, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the, specifically the robot radio. Um, so in previous years, I, I don't think that the current radio is, as um, 
I think it's more robust against this, but it might still be a problem. But there are known issues actually with the robot radio, uh, where if you place the radio close to your pneumatics control module, um, or you place it close to brushed motors and, and probably brushless motors as well, uh, it can actually interfere with your radio. Um, and so it can, uh, you can lose communications um, just by running your motors close to the radio or by running the compressor on the pneumatics control module. So um, definitely the radio is really the big component there since it's a communications device, you wanna keep it away from other devices that draw high current. Um, we like to put our radio, uh, if we can put it kind of high on the robot um, and definitely not down in the middle with all the metal and all the other control components around it. That's a great question. And there is another one. I'm, I'm going to translate it. It is in Spanish. How can we can take care of our batteries? Yeah, um, so we, we, we do an okay job, in my opinion, of taking care of our batteries. Um, one, of the, one of the best ways to ruin the, uh, one of the best ways to ruin a battery is to discharge it all the way down and let it sit there in a discharged state. Um, and so uh, we do a couple of things with our batteries. We limit how far we discharge them down. So during drive practice, um, we don't like to discharge them down to more than about 12 volts or maybe 11.8 volts before we replace them and put them back on the charger. Um, the other thing that we do is when we run a battery down, we immediately put it on the charger and charge it back up. Um, and so that'll prevent the battery from sulf, you know, you get a, a sulfate on the plates, which can reduce the, the capacity of the battery. Um, if you let it sit in a discharge state for a long time. Um, and then finally, you wanna make sure that you keep your batteries kind of topped off to extend battery uh, lifetime. Um, they really like to be kept at a full charge and a lot of battery chargers will float the batteries at a high voltage. So they'll kind of do a really small charge, discharge, charge, discharge from like, you know, 12.8 to 12.6 volts. Um, and that can help extend the life cycle of the batteries as well. Um, is, keeping them on the chargers and doing that float, the, using the built-in float charging on a lot of the trickle chargers. Okay, so I think that would be all the questions. Um, if anyone uh, else of the viewers have any questions, it is your moment to write it on the Q&A section. If not, um, Scott and Jess, um, I think this would be it for today. We're so thankful for you up for accepting our invitation. It was uh, great and a pleasure having you here. Yeah, thank you so much. It was our pleasure. We definitely enjoyed doing it. And it's just really fun to um, you know, after being cooped up, uh, you know, with no season, it's fun to kind of get back in the swing of things and interact with some FRC teams and have a little fun. So definitely enjoyed the opportunity. Mm -hmm.